Hallelujah. What? A Savior. I don't know about you, but I can get used to seeing new members added and new baptisms in our midst week in and week out. Oh, that's a prayer for us to have, but this is a Lord's Day Sunday for us to remember. What an opportunity every week that we're here, but what an extra special opportunity today that we were able to witness uh, two baptisms and two members uh, added. Um, Praise God for that. Let's go before our great and perfect and holy God in prayer uh, as we now turn to him in his word that he's provided for us for our good and upbuilding. Let's pray. Father, you are there for us. And we want to thank you that you're there for us, that you don't leave us, but you come after us, and that you care for us, your people, your children. Thank you for your pursuit of us, because we know in ourselves, we would have the tendency to go away from you. And sometimes we could feel like we're being drawn away from you, and in reality, we are going away from you, but we're thankful that you are there for us Would you be there for us once again as we open your word so that we might see it, to see it's good, to see what it's for, for our upbuilding and for your glory and for our help. Lord, meet us today. Encourage us. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. We ended our last week's sermon in Jonah with him going overboard, remember? Splash. This backslidden, quitting prophet thought that God wanted him dead. He was in a bad situation. And as we discussed, of course, God didn't want him dead, but God did want him overboard, as we're going to see but for another reason, but as we saw, remember, last week, Jonah suggested to the pagan sailors in the midst of that storm that God wanted him overboard and that, that they should toss him overboard, that that was the answer in the storm. That was the answer to end the storm. And if you remember, after being tossed off the boat, once Jonah went under, what happened? The storm ceased immediately. Now, after our worship service last week, uh, someone jokingly mentioned um, and, and was wondering about the poor psychological state of those sailors and, and how they must have been thinking at that point because they didn't want him overboard. They, they wanted anything but that, and they would have certainly been devastated at Jonah's fate as they would have thought that he drowned and died because he went under and under and under. And they would have thought that God himself was responsible for Jonah's demise. But little did they know, or little did even Jonah knew, as these pagan sailors transitioned to their worship service on the boat, which they did, if you remember, that Jonah was, in fact, going to be rescued in a remarkable way. Now, that is some call to worship, isn't it? Jonah overboard. Now, to start the worship service, cue the music and let's get going. That's what was going on with those sailors. Now, I'd like to think that after Jonah finally comes to his senses later, after the fish, after all the situations, after he's learned his lessons and come around in the future, and repents of his continual fighting against God and his plans that we see throughout this whole book, that he might have actually searched out these newly converted sailors in the future to bear witness of God's deliverance. And to set the record straight that he actually survived, as we're going to see here this morning. And that God didn't want him dead, after all, as he thought. And I'm sure God would also be interested in that further development and information getting to those sailors. In fact, it's possible that the news, as it spread 
all over the place. I mean, it's not every day that someone gets swallowed by a fish and lives to talk about it days later. It's possible that that news gets out and these sailors find out that way as well. But the fact is, the passage doesn't tell us. We don't know. The scriptures don't say. And the Bible also doesn't describe or explain all the details of what fish scooped Jonah up that day, as we're going to see, or how in the world he would have survived three days and three nights. The Bible just tells us that it happened, right? And because Jesus likened Jonah's experience in the fish as a type of his future death, burial, and resurrection in the New Testament, as we saw last week from Matthew 12, apparently Jesus confirmed and believed that this whole miraculous account was true as well. That was Jesus' position. And we should believe it too, right? Even if it's impossible to fathom. Because it is impossible to fathom. Why? Why? God does miraculous things. He does the impossible. We shouldn't believe it because, uh, you know, uh, it's just this easy thing. No, this is a big thing. That's the point. As I mentioned at the end of our sermon last week, I talked about reading a few different accounts of people being either swallowed by a large sperm whale in one instance that I heard about, or a a huge shark, and actually surviving. Here's the problem with that. (laughs) As I continue to read of different accounts this week, and of those said accounts, I noticed that in the commentaries or the sermons that there were some discrepancies between some of the stories where one mentioned that a whale, you know, after two days being cut open and someone surviving. And then another kind of mentioned it was a shark. And so I'm like, what is it? So I decided to look up, you know, about said examples. And I went down kind of a rabbit trail uh, about whether or not these things actually occurred. But then in the midst of that, I realized, why in the world am I so concerned about these other stories? Why? Because what happened in Jonah was a miracle of God. And the Bible is God-breathed and inspired, and we trust the accounts therein. These other articles or stories and whether or not it happened, and then the counter-articles and stories about how these things were fabricated, these things are not the God-breathed and authoritative scriptures, right? And who cares if these other accounts from the you know, late 1800s or 19, whenever they were made, whenever they happened, who cares if they're made up or not? It doesn't really matter because the Bible doesn't give us those accounts. It gives us this miraculous account of Jonah. And because Jesus believed it and because the Bible recorded it, so should we, right, church? Not because it's easy to imagine. It's not or because there's a bunch of other accounts that may or not may not be true, because, you know, those are things that aren't from the Bible may be made up accounts. Those other things may be made up, but who cares? The Bible, you see, isn't made up. And God can, in fact, get this, both appoint a really, really ridiculously big fish to swallow Jonah, which seems like it's the easier part of the equation. Why? Because we see uh, whales or sharks or really big uh, fish, and we can imagine that those types of huge, huge sea creatures going around in the depths could swallow a person whole. That much is certain. It's the whole surviving inside the fish that gets tricky, right? But we can and should believe that God can even preserve Jonah's life in the belly of that big fish. Where you'd normally think that he'd be crushed and suffocated inside the fish under the sea. Because in normal situations, that's probably what would happen, right? But how did God do this miraculous thing? It's because he's God. Let's not forget that. Nothing is too hard for him. He created the whole world. Nothing is too much for him. He did exactly what he did. It was his plan. And the whole point is that it is a miraculous, amazing miracle of amazing God-working, miracle-working God doing the impossible here. Let's see the impossible together once again in our text. And point number one, it's not too late to pray. Where we're going to see Jonah's 
rock bottom prayer. Let's look at Jonah chapter one in verse 17 through chapter two in verse two. This is the word of the Lord that we should believe because his miraculous ways, his power, it says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. And you heard my voice. After all that running and quitting and backsliding and despairing over his life itself, Jonah finally turns back to God. Now, you may be here today, and you may be running from God right this very moment, hiding from him out of shame or out of your disobedience and, and sin. You might be running from God. Know this, if Jonah turned to God in his despair and bad place when he was at the lowest point of his life wanting to die and thinking that God even wanted him dead, know this, no matter how far you've gone away from God, it's not too late. It's never too late. It's not too far. It's never too far to turn back to God in desperate prayer as well. Would you turn to him? In fact, you see, God often uses these rock-bottom moments in our lives to turn our hearts back to him, to cry out to him in our desperation. God wants us to be desperate for him. When we aren't, we depend on ourselves, don't we? We go it alone. We make up the rules, ideas, and plans, all without him. And that is not the way to go. That's the way that Jonah went. But as he found himself sinking and realizing how bankrupt that plan was, what did he do? He cried out to God. Oftentimes, here's the sad thing, we can look down on desperate people who can't get their act together. Can't we? And if they pray in a state like that, we might think about them, even if we might not say it. They're only going to God because things are so bad off. And we can judge them as weak. Pathetic even. But life with God, without God, right, without him, is so bad off. Don't you see that? That's the point. So if Jonah prays in a desperate place, isn't that a good turn of events in Jonah's life? Wouldn't that be good if we see desperate people in difficult places, even if it's the bed that they made? Isn't it good to see them turning back in desperation to God? If they pray in that state, we might judge them, but we need to see that them seeing their bad off is where God is bringing them. It's good for them to turn that way because God does it. He's a God who doesn't quit on us even if we quit on him. Even though he was this backslidden sleeper, God didn't sleep on him. I'm just happy when someone wakes up to their need of God. Are you? No matter their circumstances, if you are bad off here today, right this very morning, not, know what, not sure what you're going to do this afternoon or, or, or what's next and how you can get out of this hole that you're in, if you're sinking like Jonah and you know that you need God and you come to that realization here this morning, praise God for that. You are better than the one who thinks that they have no need for God because they're all put together, prim and proper, happy, good on the outside. Good for you for realizing your need for God, your desperate need for him. 
And even though we have already seen that Jonah's account kind of is a roller coaster, it really is a roller coaster of ups and downs, and that even in this prayer in the belly of the fish, and even after this moment in the fish is over, that later Jonah's going to revert back to his old ways at the end of the book. We've already talked about that. But here's the thing. Some people can look at that big picture of Jonah here, and they can look ahead and then read about this rock bottom prayer and they could turn it and twist it and think and say that what's going on here in the belly of the fish is just the kind of false piety and pride in Jonah in that fish. As if he were just pridefully still hard hearted like he was at the beginning of the book when he was running from God. Because we all know how the story's gonna end a little bit later so people are like, yeah, it, that, he must have been, this must be this just prayer of pride and things of that nature. But I think that is the exactly wrong way to read this rock bottom prayer in the belly of this fish. Why? Because something has to explain the change in Jonah from running away from God towards Tarshish on that boat to then after this fish belly prayer experience to him being willing to do what God says and when he would go the next time to Nineveh. Something genuinely had to be happening here, right? A hard-hearted prayer of self-righteous snobbery doesn't account for that change in Jonah, does it? And it also doesn't account for how God works in believers' lives or even how the life of a believer works either. They're missing the point. How many of you, when you were converted years ago, think back to your testimony and when you became a believer, how many of you simply never had a bad day after your conversion into the future? The chuckles are right because we know that's baloney. How many of you just prayed always 100% of the time in a 100% fervent way as we talked about today in Sunday school in Daniel in fervent prayer. How many of us are always 100% of the time just on fire for the Lord, praying and just sold out every day since we were converted without any hiccups or missteps or sin? How many of us just arrived back then? None of us then why can't we see a change of heart and dependence on God here in Jonah as well, even though we know he's going to mess it all up in the future? Why? One preacher made the rather adept observation that Christians don't seem to have a lot of nuance and patience with the idea of failure in the Christian life. I think he's right about that. He said, we can think Christians don't get worse, he said. They get better. It makes sense. It makes no sense, he said, therefore, that Jonah would have been getting better here only to get worse later in the book. That's his observation. I think that's a correct observation. That's how we can think about these things. It's why when we read Jonah, we could, we could just see the negative future outcome and not see anything good along the way. So much so that as I looked at different commentaries and preachers, Many of them would go on and on about the insincere and proud prayer of Jonah because he was so centered on himself, they say, and, and they already know what happens in the future, so it couldn't have been genuine. But as we stand here in the book at a crossroads, which it is here in chapter 2 and 3 here, something different's happening that we saw in 1, and realizing that God is working in his rebellious preacher's life in his pursuit of him, because when God pursues his sheep and finally brings them to the end of themselves, as we see here, I think, in Jonah's experience, then even if they don't get their full act together and move forward in perfection after the great redirection that God brings into their lives, I think that we should still be able to see a good work of God even in his fallen, imperfect people. Just think of your own life. You and I have done good things at times in the past, things in full faith, full-hearted 
faith in God, only then later in the future to mess it all up. I think that's what we see here in Jonah's life. Not to mention, (laughs) it's kind of hard to take this prayer in the belly of a fish as a negative. Here's why. I think this is the clincher argument because Jonah in the fish recites psalms of thanksgiving of sorts. His is a song of thanksgiving, but he's clearly here influenced by many other psalms. If you don't believe me, just look at the footnotes in this prayer. You'll see a bunch of footnotes to all these other thanksgiving psalms. You turn to one of them and it's, he's saying the same things that these other psalmists were saying, you see. So if Jonah was prideful and all these types of things and arrogant, that doesn't make any sense because his prayer in the belly of the fish is just oozing Bible, oozing scripture. Are all those other psalmists prideful and wrong in their prayers as well as we see in the other portions of the Psalms? Of course not. That is a bad take. And we just need to see here that we are just like Jonah, aren't we? And so is every other imperfect Christian who is on a journey seeking to be more and more like Jesus in the Christian life, even in their imperfection and stumbling throughout of their Christian life, because none of us have arrived or will arrive this side of heaven. So we better get used to crying out to God in our desperation, which is just what believers do. Even if we might fail yet again next week or next month or next year or even the next day. We must not think that God only hopes those helps those who help themselves. That's worldly thinking, you see, not biblical. That's void of grace and mercy. Jonah thinks he's about to die when he goes overboard. Being judged by God is what he thinks. And when he's sinking down, as we're going to see in a minute, he realizes that this is the end for him. And in his disconnection with God, he knows he's sinking down, 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 and likens it to Sheol because he's almost dead, almost gone, almost lost. This is a backslidden place he's in, a lonely place he's in. He's sinking, and he cries out to God in his sinking. Out of the depths, he prays, church, It's not too late for you to pray either. Would you also soften your heart this very day and cry out to God and pray? And also, and this leads us to point number two, would you submit to God's sovereignty? Look with me now at verses three through six for this. Jonah says, for you cast me into the deep Into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. Jonah was in the pit, metaphorically, prior to being thrown overboard, right? (laughs) Have you ever been in a pit like that? Are you in that pit right now? If so, submit to God in his sovereignty over your life, and even over your circumstances. God has not abandoned you. Even if you're sinking, he's not turning his face from you. He's not ignoring you. Jonah was sinking both metaphorically in his backslidden way and also physically when he was tossed off that boat. Now remember, This psalm of thanksgiving that Jonah pens or recounts after coming out (laughs) clearly was after coming out of that big fish, right? Even though he prayed it within. Because even though we've seen that this whole thing is a miracle of God, 
as I've been saying, it's not as if Jonah had pen and ink and candle already ready in, in the belly of the fish to write down these things while he was in there. That's not how it went down. He recounts these things later. He records these things later. But it is true, in that belly, he did pray these things. And then later, he wrote down and recounted it and passed that along. But while he was praying in the belly of the big fish to God, he recalls, didn't you see, as we just read, he recalls in the belly, once he's safe inside, <laughs> see, once he's safe inside, he recalls the experience of his earlier sinking under the sea, right? And as he was going down, down in an earlier round, sugar were going down swinging, as the popular Fallout Boy song goes. He was going down. He's in his prayer in the belly of the fish, safe inside the fish, recounting his sinking before being rescued by this big fish, all in the belly of the fish. Remember, Jonah thought he was going to die. He thought God wanted him dead. But now, when he was in the belly of the big fish, he realized that, oh, I was wrong about that. And it's not like Jonah could have done anything to pick himself up by his own bootstraps and save himself there, could he? By swimming into the belly of the fish. Ooh, look it, there's a big fish. I'm gonna go and I'm just gonna dive in. That's not what God was doing here. That's not what Jonah was doing it. We know that. Jonah knew that. He knew that he was rescued don't you think that a man rampant and running and fleeing from God might feel a great distance from God and that was part of his discouraging place that he was in? He thought, he thought God hated him. Oh, and let me tell you, he was wrong. God loved him and pursued his sinful preacher prophet because he leaves the 99 to go after the one as we saw last week. And that is what God was doing with God. Jonah, using a big fish to go after the straying one. You see that? And now that Jonah was in the belly of the fish, he all of a sudden saw it. Like a light bulb going out, out of the blue. <laughs> Which was literally what was happening, right? Jonah's light bulb going off in the depths of the sea and then inside that dark whale's tomb of a body. It finally just clicked for Jonah. He knew now that God didn't hate him and want him dead. He knew now that God loved him and was rescuing him. You see, it just went off. Before, when he was backsliding, he wasn't thinking clearly. Things were fuzzy. He was spiraling, believing the lies that God hated him and wanted him dead. But now, when he finally wakes up in the belly of this big fish, he knows that right before God's providential uber of a whale picked him up that he was sinking with the waves a rocking and the seaweed wrapped around his head. He could see the ocean mountain-like floor below and thought he was going to die. He felt so alone. He felt so far away from God because he was far away from God. His heart was gone or, or, or far gone from God. But God, or yet God, as verse 6b says, and let's see it again from the passage in Jonah 2, 6b, yet you, Jonah says to God, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. Who brought him up? God brought him up. Who can bring you up? God can bring you up if you are his child he will bring you up from the pit to cry out to this God don't run from him cry out to him and then also think of this who is responsible for Jonah going overboard you might say the sailors well Jonah drew the short end of the stick and Jonah got chucked off the boat by the sailors <laughs> That might be your answer, but that's not who Jonah says was responsible for this whole getting tossed off the boat thing. Who was it, church? 
if we would just submit and believe in our sovereign God, we would know the answer already. But Jonah tells us again in verse three, we already saw it, maybe we missed it, maybe we didn't, maybe we forget it. Let's look at it again. At Jonah 2, 3, he says, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. He said, you cast me. God, Jonah has submitted and acknowledged God's good sovereignty even over his desperate situation. Do you see that? And Jonah going overboard wasn't the only example of God's hand of providence and sovereignty that we've seen so far. The Bible knowledge commentary helps us with this and re reminds us of the seven things we've seen so far. And I quote, seven miracles have taken place already in this short narrative. God caused a violent storm, Jonah 1.4. Had the lot fall on Jonah, Jonah 1.7. Calmed the sea when Jonah was thrown overboard, 1.15. Commanded the fish to swallow Jonah, 1.17. Had the fish transport him safely, and had the fish throw Jonah up on dry land, and perhaps the greatest of all, melted the disobedient prophet's heart, evidenced by his thanksgiving prayer here in chapter 2. If you're with us today and you're not on board with God's plan for the world and for your life, you better just submit to him right now. Trust him. He's trustworthy and powerful. He is sovereign and good. Because if you can trust him, your heart will never be melted like Jonah's was here. Because God is sovereign and working and moving in mysterious and even unpleasant ways at times to pursue you and draw you to himself. Submit to him. Stop running from him. Surrender him to him. He is God. He's our heavenly father. You can trust him. And also, let's see the big fish surrender of Jonah right now in our third and final point in number three, come out of retirement. Come out of retirement. Now you might be thinking, hey, Daniel, this whole thing's about Jonah, not me. <laughs> you should have titled the point, Jonah comes out of retirement, but not so. As we've already seen, this isn't just about Jonah. It's about you and me too. So I say it again, come out of retirement. Look with me now at Jonah chapter two in verses seven through 10 for this. He says, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you. Into your holy temple, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Dear straying sheep, backslidden Christian, come out of retirement like Jonah came out of retirement. Let your heart be melted by God. Most of this series has been about not making the same mistakes of the quitting prophet Jonah. But here we see Jonah no longer quitting on God, but turning in his application, if you will, to reapply as a prophet of God, right there in the belly. This is big fish belly surrender. Jonah is finally at the end of his rope and hitting rock bottom and feeling alone to only then be swooped up in the middle of the sea in the mouth of the really big fish to uncomfortably be jammed inside the belly of this fish. If it was a fish, it would have been like cold, cold blooded, like really cold and uncomfortable inside that fish. If it was a whale, for instance, it may have been a warm-blooded mammal, which would have also been uncomfortable, but very, very hot. Either way, it would have been terrible. And did I mention it was inside a belly <laughs> of a fish? 
smoldering with stomach acids, must have been burning, uh, oozing, uncomfortable, even painful for Jonah. But he was safe in that belly. Why? Because he knew God had rescued him. The light bulb went on. He submitted to God's sovereignty and he prayed unabashedly. He hit rock bottom and he turned to his God. This was a believer crying out to God, don't you see? This was a quitting prophet coming out of retirement to surrender to God. Here's where Jonah's worship service began. <laughs> Three days later, after the pagan sailors had worshiped God on the boat that admittedly Jonah did not know about because Jonah was kind of predisposed, understandably, with the whole seaweed and sinking and, you know, the whole big old fish swallowing incident. He didn't know that they were worshiping above on the boat. But when Jonah was at his weakest point, he remembered the Lord in prayer and worship. This is the reality of what we see. The preacher finally picks up the Bible, so to speak, to get back after it. He's praying scripture. He's saturated with the truths of God and thanksgiving in that, in that fish because he thought he was going to die, but then he wasn't going to die. He's no longer running from God and hitching a ride on a boat and acting the sleeper in the heart of the ship. No, now he's praying and vowing and planning and sacrificing. The pagans were at the early service, if you will, unbeknownst to Jonah, Jonah was at the second service only three days later in the belly of the fish, not much capacity for worshipers in that service, right? <laughs> and also notice that like the sailors who worship God, even when the storm had stopped, the danger was gone. When there was no more danger, we see that in them. Jonah, in this situation though, worshiped God, not when everything just got better for him either, and he was out on dry land. It's not like, you know, he was, he's still in this belly for, for Jonah. He's still in a bad way for Jonah. And he began to surrender and worship and pray while he was still inside that stinky fish. I think Jonah's just not getting God. And nothing's changing. No, this is a heart of a man turning back to God. And he knew that he was running before and almost dying before, but now he was surrendering to worship God alone. To forsake all other idols and falsehoods and false gods and to pursue the only true God, as he says right there in the belly of the fish. There is only one God. And we must all turn from all falsehood and false gods. The sailors learned that in the first service on the boat, right, they used to be worshiping false gods and then they were worshiping the true God. Jonah proclaimed that bold truth once again because that's what preachers and prophets know and do and say. He wasn't acting like he feared and reverenced God before he was tossed over. In fact, he failed to pray when everyone else needed him on that boat in that storm, he didn't even think to pray to God for deliverance and help and repentance because he was backslidden. That's where he was at then. But now you see, he prays out of the depths, <laughs> under the water, in the belly of the fish, and submits once again to the one true God. It's as if he was priming the pump to preach again. The prophet acknowledging that only the one true God is the one against all false gods, but also declaring that he himself was saved by God from the depths of the sea, out of the belly of the fish, into the belly of the fish, that salvation, he said, belongs to the Lord. Any preacher or prophet who can't say that can't do their jobs, right? But Jonah says once again that reality as he comes to his senses. And at that very moment, God, at that moment, when he surrenders, what happens? God spoke to the fish, and the fish did not delay and try to catch a ship to Tarshish like Jonah did, right? But the big fish obeyed God the first time, 
and vomited Jonah up out of its mouth onto the dry land. Amazing. And it's as if Jonah was spit out to take his prophet application papers, slimy and all messed up, back to God to do what God had told him to do to begin with. And that is just exactly what we're going to see next time in chapter 3. And this big fish uber held Jonah safely for three days and nights, as we saw last week and even here today, then spit him up on an unknown, an unknown shore. But like I suggested last week, maybe even on the shores, kind of closer on his way to Nineveh, maybe God led that big fish to get Jonah into a good position to call him once again to Nineveh. But wherever Jonah was spit up, the passage doesn't say, because we don't know exactly where he was vomited up, but that he was spit up after surrendering to God to do his job once again, I think is very, very clear. Because you see, in the belly of that fish, Jonah was redirected by God to Nineveh one way or another because it was inside that big fish that Jonah finally surrendered to God and his will and his plan for him. (laughs) The once quitting prophet is now back on the clock, right? As we're gonna see next time in chapter three. But for now, I leave us once again with the thought of a holy and sovereign God who is our father pursuing us even into the depths, even in our despair, even in our failure, pursuing us to what? Redirect us, not to get us and judge us. This this whole fish thing wasn't judgment on Jonah as you might think. No, he was getting him. He He was rescuing him. That's what God does to redirect us, to cause us to surrender to him once again, to his plan instead of our own. Would you surrender to God now yourself? Would you stop running and backsliding if you are? He loves you. And he can swoop you also up from out of the pit as well. And let's pray to our great God in this way. Our Father, we thank you for sending that fish to gather up Jonah when you did. Would you send, would you send some to us as well? Would you redirect our lives as well? Would you help us to trust you and submit our heart to you and stop running from you? Would you show your goodness and mercy? Would you help the light bulb go on and click in our minds even as it went off in Jonah's mind? Would you give us hope? Would you encourage us in your word? Would you do a work? Would you save those who are far from you and who are gone, who are lost, who don't know you from, to begin with? And would you also save those who are your children, who you're pursuing like you did Jonah, and turn them back to you if they've been running for some time. We know you can do that, and so we pray that you might do that. And we say all these things in Christ's name. Amen.